Hi everyone and welcome back to this video series on wall-modeled LES. Last time we looked at all the different wall-modeled LES approaches that are out there and tried to classify them. Starting this video we're going to focus on wall stress modeling and here we will take a step back and start from the LES equations in order to see what is actually the job of the wall stress model from a mathematical point of view. To start out, let's take a look at the LES momentum equation. I expect that you're already familiar with this equation, which I wrote here in tensorial notation. Just as a reminder, in tensorial notation, if an index appears twice in an expression, like this index j here, it implies summation over that index. Here the equations are written for incompressible flow, and in particular, I already lumped the density into the pressure, so otherwise it would be 1 over density here first, but I already lumped it here into the pressure value so that we don't have to think about density anymore. Uh, and of course, the overline here is going to represent uh, filtering operations. In order to derive a finite volume version of the LES momentum equation, we have to integrate it over a control volume. This is done here on the second row. So basically, as you can see, in front of each term appears this volume integral. Uh, also, I have contracted the sum of these two terms into one tau ig here for brevity. The next step is using the Gauss-Ostrograsky theorem in order to convert the volume integrals into surface integrals where applicable. Uh, the Gauss-Ostrograsky theorem can be applied directly to terms which have a divergence in them, so this one and this one, leading to surface integrals. Uh, but it can also be applied to the pressure gradient term with a simple trick. I'm not going to go into it, but basically you also can, can convert um, this gradient into a surface integral as well. Having done that, let us consider this equation in the near wall cell. So let V now be the volume of an one single near wall cell and S be the surface of this cell. We're also going to introduce a coordinate system which is going to simplify the math for us a bit. In particular, we're going to let X1 and X3 be aligned with the wall parallel <coughs> directions. On the other hand, X2 is going to stick out uh, into the wall normal direction. What we're interested in now is looking which of these terms are going to contribute to evaluations of, of these integrals at the wall face. So let us consider that. So the time derivative is not going to be evaluated at the face. It's going to be evaluated at the cell center, which we call P here. So we don't have to think about it. Now, the convective term is going to be zero at the wall face due to the no slip boundary condition. And the same can be said about the subgrid stresses because if we look, look at them here, we realize that they're also going to be zero due to the no slip, okay? The next term is the pressure. And pressure is not going to be zero, it's going to have some value. But uh, we have no difficulty in obtaining that value because at the wall, pressure assumes a zero gradient condition. So in order to get the value at F, we can simply copy what we have uh, in the cell center at P, and this will give us the correct boundary condition. Moreover, it is physically okay to copy the value from P to F, because actually in the inner layer of a turbulent boundary layer, pressure does not change much in the wall normal direction. We will use this fact later when we look at various types of wall stress models. So it's both physically and numerically fine to simply copy the value we have in the cell center to the wall. So the only term which remains is the viscous stress. Let's look at that term in more detail. So the first thing we want to do is simply to plug in the definition of tau ij. Recall that we said that the subgrid stresses are going to be zero at the wall. So the only thing which is left is the viscous stress component. So two times nu times Sij. Uh, then finally, we can plug in the definition of Sij as well, giving us the following expression. 
Now, the next thing we want to realize is that only one component of this uh, vector n, which is the normal to the face, is going to be non-zero. And that's the consequence of the uh, choice of our coordinate system. So the only non-zero component is obviously going to be n2, because the normal is pointing straight downwards, right? So it's going to be only one non-zero component, and its value is going to be minus 1. So that means that this whole expression transforms into this, where the only derivative we have here is with respect to x2, and finally also the second component with respect to the if uh, coordinate direction. All of this has been exact, and now we can start introducing some approximations. And the first approximations we're approximation we're going to make is that the change in the wall parallel directions are significantly slower than in the wall normal. So in other words, we're going to just kill off this term. <clears throat> and the only <clears throat> thing, sorry, which is going to be left is this dui dx2. This is a quite common assumption in boundary layer theory, and it holds very well. Typically, you have much steeper gradients in the wall normal direction than in the wall parallel. One thing one should also note is that actually du2 dx2 is strictly zero, and that's analytical. Uh, basically, if you look at the velocity profile of a vertical velocity profile near the wall, you'll see that it converges to a straight line near the wall, so its gradient is, is actually zero. So that means that <clears throat> only two components uh, of, uh, of this term is actually going to be non-zero, corresponding to i equal to 1 and i equal to 3. But OK, so now that we have this, it's time to approximate the integral. And the way we do that in the finite volume method is that we evaluate this expression at the phase center, f, and then we multiply it by the surface of the face, which I'm going to call S. Finally, we also have this minus here due to the fact that, as we said, the normal points downward. So it's going to be minus 1, the value of this N2 component. OK, we have shown that this surface integral evaluates to the following expression. Now we're going to give it a name. In particular, we're going to call it the wall shear stress and assign it to the variable tau wall, filtered tau wall. Uh, this is a vector quantity with two components corresponding to i equal to 1 and i equal to 3. Furthermore, we're going to define its magnitude as simply filtered tau wall without any further indices, just by taking the magnitude of the vector. Okay, so there's some things I want to stress here. So first of all, the filtered tau wall is a transient quantity, right? So we're, it's going to change from time step to time step of the simulation. The second thing I want to stress is that this filtered tau wall is not the same as the tau wall without the filter. So the tau wall without, without the filter is the instantaneous value of the wall shear stress at the face center, okay? Now, on the other hand, this filtered tau wall approximate the average of the unfiltered tau wall across the whole face. Okay? So filtered tau wall is an average of unfiltered tau wall across the face. So they're not the same. And finally, also, it goes without saying that the average wall shear stress is also not the same as the filtered one because this, of course, is not a transient quantity. Rather, this is just a time average of this instantaneous wall shear stress at f um, taken over a reasonable period of time. So how do we deal with computing this wall shear stress? Well, the most straightforward approach is simply take a finite difference. So what do we do then? We take the difference between the velocity at the cell center and the velocity at the face center and divided by the distance between the two, right? This is a first order approximation using a finite difference. Uh, moreover, since the velocity at the wall is actually zero due to no, no slip, uh, this is going to disappear, right? So the only thing which is left is minus nu times the velocity at the cell center and divided to the by the distance to the wall. So 
This works great when you're doing a conventional wall resolved LES. Why? Because then your grid is adapted to the inner link scales and the height of this first cell center should be approximately y plus one. What that means is that you are in the region where there's actually a linear relationship between the uh, wall shear stress and the velocity. Unfortunately, when you're doing wall modeled LES, you no longer adapt the grid to the inner link scales, right? That's the whole idea. We want to save resources by doing that. That means that this finite difference can no longer give you an accurate approximation of the wall shear stress. The reason is basically because the linear relationship no longer holds further from the wall. So we have to do something else. And what we're going to do is introduce an extra model, which given some data from the LES, for example, the velocity signal from some cell center off the wall, going to compute the correct value of tau wall for us. Okay. And this model is the wall model, right? So this is the job of the wall model in wall stress modeling. That's the reason why it's called wall stress modeling, right? The job of the wall model is to produce the value of the wall stress. All right, let's recap. So in this video, we first looked at the LES momentum equation, integrated it, and then applied the gauss ostrogratsky theorem. Then we looked closely at the viscous stress term and its contribution at the wall. And when we did that, we realized that actually we need an extra model in order to compute that contribution, which is called the wall shear stress. So the final thing I want to say is just to reiterate what the ideal wall model does. And that is, it provides the correct values of the components of a filtered wall shear stress at each time step for each wall face in the simulation. All right. So in the next video, we're actually going to look at the different types of wall stress models and how they compute the wall shear stress for us. In order to make sure that you don't miss the next video, consider subscribing to the channel and pressing that little bell thingy so that you actually get notified when a new video arrives. Bye for now.